Ciao, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to my presentation about my study abroad experience in Italy this last summer. Um, I just want to start out saying, if at any time during my presentation you have a question or a comment about whatever I say or whatever you see on the on the screen, feel free to just blurt it out or raise your hand and I'll try to see you and, and we can um, get through questions as we go. So, with that, um, a little introduction to myself. My name is Mackenzie Moshka. I'm the daughter of John and Jane Moshka. I'm a senior at Nebraska Westland in Lincoln. Um, where I study mathematics. Um, the plan is to um, go to grad school after I graduate and study statistics and either be um, a sports statistician or something in the medical field. Um, that's my plan right now. Um, how I got to study abroad is I have a scholarship called the Hagen Scholarship. Um, it's only given to students um, who are in a county of 50,000 people or less and within that scholarship, the grantor um, encourages students to study abroad. So I applied for his study abroad scholarship as well. And that's um, the main way that I was able to study abroad. So this is what um, I'm going to cover in my presentation. Um, where I was and where I went during my um, six weeks abroad. Um, a little bit about my living situation, what transportation is like um, in Italy. Um, the food culture, which is a, an awesome topic. Uh, churches and basilicas, um, Catholic relics, Marian shrines, holy symbols in public places, and then finally end on the Vatican and the Pope. So where was I and where did I go? I was mostly in Rome, Italy um, throughout the six weeks. That's where I was living. That's where my study abroad and my school was at. Um, but I also went to Frascati, Italy. It's a small, smaller town outside of Rome where um, their main agriculture is um, vineyards and grapes. They make a lot of wine there. Um, we also went to Florence, which is just north of Rome. Um, the main difference between Florence and Rome is that Florence has much more artistic um, influences. Um, finally, we went to Naples, and then also Positano and Amalfi, which are more coastal towns in Italy. Um, and then also one weekend, my friends and I took a trip to Greece, and we saw Athens, as well as the island of Santorini, too. So my apartment in Rome, this is the exterior of the building. Um, pretty simple, pretty humble. Um, it's gated, so we had keys that would get us in and out of the gate and then in and out of our apartment um, unit. I'll start here with this B in the middle. There was two stairways once you got in. Our apartment was up stairway B. Um, and then here was a typical bedroom in our apartment. We had six girls living in one unit and um, two girls would share a room. So we had three bedrooms in total, two full bathrooms. Um, while we're on the topic of bathrooms, we also had bidets. I didn't uh, ever feel quite comfortable to try it out, but uh, I, I'm assuming by your laughter you all know what the purpose of a bidet is, so I won't go into much further detail about that. But um, this is the view from our apartment. You can see um, between these trees is the Tiber River. Um, that's the easiest way to know how to navigate around Rome is you orient yourself to the Tiber River. It runs right about through the center of Rome. Um, finally, this is our kitchen. Um, pretty plain and simple. This is a nice, decent kitchen for a Roman apartment. Um, we had a sink, a stove, a, um, an oven, and we also had a washing machine, your basic kitchen appliance. Um, the washing machines in the United States are supersized compared to the ones in Rome. Um, the drum of the machine that we used was maybe like 18 inches by 8 inches deep, give or take. And if you overfilled it, you were having, um, you would have issues. You'd have to call um, someone to fix your plants for you and um, try to communicate in Italian. It was just easier to not overfill the machine. So. Uh, this is myself and my six roommates as well. They were all from different states in the United States. So no language barrier there. We all got to speak English with each other and we all became really good friends. So next I'm gonna talk about um, transportation. 
in and out of Rome. Um, the main way of transportation for the most part was just using your own two feet. And I think I averaged about eight to 10 miles a day just walking. That was about average. But um, this is the type of um, surface that you're walking on most of the time, just cobblestones. By a show of hands, who thinks they could manage walking in heels on these cobblestones? <laughs> I don't see any hands, which is probably smart. <laughs> really, the only people who wear heels in Rome are... Uh, <laughs> Kirk, you think you could wear a manager? <laughs> really, the only people who wear heels in Rome are ladies who are very experienced, and I don't know how they do it, but somehow they've acquired a, a talent for doing it. Um, the next most popular way that we would get around is by bus or by tram. Um, a ticket costs like a dollar or a euro and 25 cents, which is roughly like a dollar fifty. Um, and sometimes they're really empty and you can sit down and other times they're packed and you're squished in like this and you're trying to guard your things and also like not feel too uncomfortable, but it's all part of the Roman experience in the end. Um, the way we get in and out of Rome to go to Florence or to go to Naples um, was by train. And there's two different kinds of trains. There's a fast train and a slow train. The slow is usually cheaper, but it goes about mm, roughly 80 miles an hour. So it takes a little bit longer to get there. The fast train is a little bit more expensive, but you go around like 180 to 200 miles an hour. So you get there a lot faster. Um, locals typically travel in super small cars, little Fiats or little smart cars or they drive a moped. There's so many mopeds. And the pedestrians and the traffic share this cobblestone street. There's no distinguishing between sidewalk and street. So to get through, the little mopeds beat their little horns and people just move out of the way. That's just how it goes. Finally, my favorite topic, food and drink in Rome. So um, when I say the words Italian food, what comes to mind? Let's have some answers. Spaghetti, meat sauce, meatballs, fettuccine alfredo, pizza, yeah, yeah. Um, most of those things are not actually real Italian food. <laughs> what Italian food really is? Mostly pastries, a lot of pastries. Typical Italians start their day out with a pastry and like a small coffee. When I say small, it's like a teacup size um, of espresso or... Um, or just a regular coffee. Um, I'll try to pronounce some of these. I don't know many of them, but this is a sfogliatella, as they say. I think it's called a lobster tail in the United States, but it's filled with like this cheesy, fruity inside. Um, they're so, so good and really crispy. Um, this is a typical bakery window. You, they just display everything and lure you in <laughs> that way. Um, we also have Pasta is a typical part of the Roman diet. Um, these two on the ends, this one and this one, are carbonara pasta. It's made with um, cheese. Um, it's called uh, pancetta, which is like a thick bacon-like substance. Eggs and black pepper, and it's really simple, but also really, really good. Um, and then these other two are examples of like where you would have a red sauce, but None of them have meatballs or loads of red meat. That's typical of the Italian um, food, food culture. There's not much red meat. We also have aperitivo, which is similar to an American happy hour. You go and into a restaurant and say that you want an aperitivo. They'll ask you how many people are in your party. You say four. And then they'll prepare you a plate like this that can feed four people an appetizer. And then it also comes with um, drinks, usually wine, or my favorite was called an Aperol Spritz. Aperol is like an orange alcohol, and then it's mixed with Prosecco, which is like a sparkling wine. Super good. Um, but usually it's cheeses and meats and fresh fruit, fresh veggies. All of those things are staples of uh, a typical Roman meal. And then there's gelato. I think my roommates and I ate gelato every night. <laughs> we would go out and find some place that we hadn't tried yet. Um, 
And it usually wasn't that expensive, maybe like a dollar fifty a a piece to two two euros, not dollars, euros. Um, and but you have to be careful about where you go because um, certain gelato places look really good, but they're not really good quality. If you see a mounded pile of gelato, that is not a good place to go to because it's typically filled with lots of preservatives that make it stay and stick in that form. So you have to look for ones that are just flat, sitting in there, in their little tubs. And also the second thing you look for is color. This is pistachio. Um, this is the typical color of a natural pistachio. But sometimes you see them where they're like bright mint green. And that is a telltale sign that it's not a natural pistachio flavor. But also we have staples of Roman cuisine um, that are wine, fish, Pizza, this is actually an aperitivo that my, my friends and I had, um, and tiramisu, and bread. So then we also have churches. Actually, let me pause and ask if anybody has any questions or comments yet. Okay, yes. So is the pizza different than the pizza here? Yes, good question. Um, it's very different. The first place we went to was oddly, it was a Chinese pizza place. <laughs> it was just around the corner from our apartment and it wasn't very expensive and we were all jet lagged so it worked out just fine. But um, yeah, I ordered a margarita pizza and here in the United States that's typically what basil, tomato sauce, and mozzarella yeah, on your pizza bread. Um, it was just pizza sauce on a really thin crust. That's all it was. And I was, I felt a little ripped off at first, but um, that was a learning experience. And so now I know what a typical Roman margarita pizza is. But typically the crust is very thin. Um, there's not a ton of sauce on it. And um, they just pile the ingredients on. Yeah. Any other questions? I, we did eat at a, an American place uh, just for, for kicks. And, um, it was called Roadhouse. <laughs> um, we were just all really craving a good burger by this point in our study abroad experience. So we went and um, I got a hamburger, but the inside was like almost bloody. And so I was trying to convey to the waiter, can you take this back and maybe cook it for a little bit longer? And I think I offended him because he was like, I, he didn't really understand what I was saying. and so. He brought it back to me and it was cooked back and you know I had eaten a little bit of the first one, this is a brand new burger and um, <laughs> I couldn't eat it all because I'd eaten a little bit of the first one. So I went up to him and I was like, could I have a, a to-go box? And he said, no. <laughs> that was it and I didn't know what to do but my hamburger was like sitting on a piece of paper so I wrapped it up and took it to go. We had that figured out. <laughs> okay, so I guess we'll move on to churches. It was a huge part of Rome. Literally every corner of the city has a church on it of some sort, um, and they're all Catholic. Um, so we'll go into the differences between a church and a basilica. Um, a church is typically really small. You can see it's like squished in between like two buildings here, um, <clears throat> whereas a basilica is massive. Like there's no feasible thing in the United States, church-wise, that I could use to compare to a basilica in Rome. Um, but both are extremely beautiful on the inside. This is a picture of the, the apse, or the altar of the church. And then um, this main, the main aisle is called the nave. So here's the apse, and then the nave would be like back down here. Um, this this is the basilica, this is the church. Um, and then here is the ceiling above the nave, above the main aisle in the church and the basilica. So they're very, very beautiful on the inside. And you can see there's a lot of gold, especially in the ceiling. And that's purposeful because like above you is where <coughs> heaven would be. Heaven typically would be resembled as gold in a church. So we have four papal basilicas in Rome. Um, the first is St. Peter's Basilica, which I'm sure you've all heard of. Um, another one is St. Paul outside the walls. 
St. Mary Major and St. John Lateran. Um, contrary to popular belief, popular belief um, St. Peter's is not the, the most extravagant or most influential church out of these four. It's actually St. John Lateran. That's the papal seat of Rome. Um, but they're all, again, extremely beautiful. Um, here you can see the nave and the apse of, all each, of each one. They're all a little bit similar, but all different in their own unique way, too. <laughs> Here's a different church that was in Florence um, celebrating a big milestone anniversary. It's called San Miniato al Monte, celebrating its 1,000th anniversary of being a church. This was just an accident that I came across this, this church. Um, in Florence, I kind of like separated from my group and went off exploring on my own. And it was up on a hill that had a beautiful like outlook of the city. And then you, if you climbed a little bit farther, this church was like at the pinnacle of the city. And um, you can see there's not really an altar right here where there should be. That's because you have to go down some steps back through this arch and then the altar is underneath the, the main front of the church. And you weren't allowed to take any pictures down there because it's so old and so ancient. They want to preserve it. But just the sheer like, age of this building alone is, is incredible. I've never seen anything like that. Even a Polish church. Um, there's something for everybody. <laughs> and there's a huge, not a huge, but there's just a population of all different sorts in Rome. There's Polish, there's Italian, there's American, any, anything you can think of, really. But um, most of the masses I attended were in Italian. A handful I found in English, um, but this was the only one that was in Polish. And it was honestly really hard to understand. <laughs> I have no knowledge of the Polish language at all. And um, at least in Italian, um, like Father, Son, Holy Spirit, sounds similar to what you know, um, but in Polish, it doesn't. <laughs> we were a little bit late getting there for Mass, so we ended up <laughs> having to sit in the front row, <laughs> and we had no idea what we were doing. <laughs> we had no idea when you sit, when you stand, what you say, when you say it, and so, needless to say, it, it all worked out in the end, but we were a little bit lost the whole entire time. Um, if anyone knows any Polish, how to read it, this is one of the hymns that we sang in church. Um, thank you for, thank you, God, that you, that you posted these these words for us to read, to try to read anyways. You know, we were, we were trying to follow along at least. But they have, um, say, Pope John Paul II um, in the front of the church, as he should be, um, because he was a Polish person and... Um, they, they love Pope John Paul II. There was also many churches that had relics of saints. Um, here is the foot of Mary Magdalene, the relic of the Holy Crib. This is a piece of the, um, the crib that Jesus was in, the manger. Um, here's the head of John the Baptist. It's a little hard to see in this picture, but um, he's in there right there. There's his mouth right there. Um, and then here is um, the relics of St. Uh, Saint Sebastian. Any questions so far? Yeah. They have Sunday Mass and churches and basilicas. Uh -huh. um, usually on Sundays, the um, basilicas are um, more closed to the public because it's a holy day and they have Masses going on all throughout the day. Um, even like throughout the week, um, there's several groups who take pilgrimages to Rome, so when they stop in St. Peter's, they'll usually have a priest with them, and then the pilgrimage will have a mass, and so um, really no matter what time, um, well speaking of St. Peter's Basilica anyways, no matter what time you went in there, there was usually a mass going on at some point in time, and there's several small chapels. Um, the Pope is the only one allowed to do mass at the high altar in a papal basilica, so there's like several small chapels on either side of the, the nave, the main uh, aisle. And so these groups will just be assigned a chapel and they'll have mass in a chapel. 
but yes, also the, the small, smaller churches do have mass on Sundays as well. Um, it was a little hard to like find times for those because not all of them are technologically savvy and um, they don't post their, their times on, on a website. So um, if there was one that you found interesting, you'd have to go, go inside of it and find where they have their mass times posted and then be back at that time on Sunday. Um, so there's a lot of places that I wasn't able to attend Mass in because the times didn't align, but um, yeah, it was all very, very beautiful. Any other questions? Okay. Um, this is really cool. Um, there's a lot of Marian shrines. Um, as you're walking down the street in Rome, on the side of a building, there'll be a picture of Mary just staring down at you, and, and it's just a normal thing. It's really, really cool. That's just the culture in Rome. It's so Catholic that, you know, they all know Mary as mother and um, guardian, and so <clears throat> you can just be walking along, you see Mary, you maybe say a prayer or something, and, and then just go about your day. And so this is one that... Um, like, I was just walking, and there's these open doors. I peeked in, and it was, like, this is what the inside looked like. You could kneel, and you could pray with a picture of Mary in front of you, and then just be on your way. But then this, this one's cool. Like, you, they just open the door every day to a picture of Mary. And, and someone, somewhere, just religiously opens and closes this door. Maybe it doesn't even close. Maybe they just leave it open all the time. But, yeah, it's, it's just... It's just different, but I, I really liked it a lot. Um, speaking of holy symbols in, in public, there were many holy symbols in different businesses as well. So um, if there wasn't something big or um, obviously Catholic or obviously holy, they had, um, if you went to check out, they would have a little like postcard of Papa Francesco by their um, cash register, or a picture of Mary, or a picture of Jesus, just something small right next, right, so the business leaders, business owners could see it day in and day out, or when, if you were a, um, a uh, consumer, you were at the business paying and um, whatnot, you could see it as well when you go to check out. Um, this one is one of my favorites. Um, we had gone to a, a, business to have an operativo one day and you could just plain as day see this crucifix hanging between all the meat hanging on the ceiling um this was also in that same business a picture of mary by the bathrooms go to the bathroom you see mary yeah. um vatican city and the pope um there's a picture of um saint peter's right right on the tiber river um at sunset so the Vatican City is home to um, not just St. Peter's, but it has um, also the Vatican Museums, and um, that's where the Pope lives also, of course. And he has, um, there's a handful of cardinals who live with him as well. He doesn't just live by himself. Um, a little bit more about St. Peter's Basilica. Um, it's the largest Catholic church in the entire world. Um, to put it in perspective, to... American-sized football fields can fit along the the main aisle, the nave of the church. It's insane. It can hold up to 60,000 people. So this is where the Pope will perform um, papal masses most of the time. And then if the papal audience needs to be moved inside because of weather, really, weather issues or anything like that, they will hold it in St. Peter's Basilica because it can hold so many people. Also, um, back to relics, St. Peter is buried underneath the high altar. That's another reason why the Pope is the only person who can celebrate Mass at the high altar, because it's such a holy, a holy spot. Um, also, there's more than 100 tombs underneath the main floor of the Vatican, and 91 of those are Popes of, uh, from the past years. Um, Here's a, some images of St. Peter's that are in St. Peter's Basilica. 
St. Peter is always pictured holding keys because Jesus gave him the keys to heaven. So that's the way you know who St. Peter is. Here's another one. And oftentimes people will touch his foot just as a sign of reverence. It's also home to the Vatican Museums. There's 4.3 miles of artwork in the Vatican Museums, um, including the Sistine Chapel. Um, the one thing I want to point out about this picture is that, uh, again, you can recognize who people are by what they're holding. Here's St. Peter, because he's holding a key. And over here is St. Paul, because he's holding a sword. This is a picture that doesn't do much justice to Saint, the Sistine Chapel. Um, you're not allowed to take pictures in the Sistine Chapel because they want to preserve it. And also because um, imagine if you were in there and everyone just had their phones up to the ceiling taking pictures all over the place. It would not be near as enjoyable as if you just stood and, and looked up at it. Um, so that's why you're not allowed to take pictures. Um, this is all painted by Michelangelo. It was completed in 1483. Um, it took him four years to do it. And like for the ceiling, for example, he did it all with just scaffolding and just looking up like this. He didn't lay down because like, that would distort his, the way he'd been viewing it the whole time. So he just painted like this the whole time. Can you imagine how badly your neck would hurt after four years of doing that? But it all turned out. He was a sculptor originally, not a painter. So he was kind of surprised when um, the Pope who commissioned him to do this picked him because he wasn't a painter, but rather a sculptor. But um, because he was a sculptor, the, the pictures, like the bodily forms in um, the Sistine Chapel painted in here look much more lifelike and real. Um, another example, um, this is a different piece of artwork in the Vatican Museums, but it shows the story of when Peter was imprisoned after Jesus had ascended. Um, and an angel came and freed him from jail while the soldiers were sleeping. Um, but you didn't need to know anything about um, the Bible or anything about um, uh, like imagery or anything like that because the story is so clear and so simple. So people who are illiterate could easily understand this story because of this painting. Ooh, this is another one. Um, there's the tapestry room in the Vatican Museums. All of the, the artwork in the tapestry room are humongous tapestries. Like, probably half of this wall would be the size of a tapestry. And you can see, like, can you imagine how long it would take to, like, change colors and, like, look at Jesus' hair, for example. Can you imagine how long it would take? My mom has told me she did a, a cross-stitch of the Last Supper, and she's like, it took so long because you have to change colors. And this is humongous. Okay, back onto the Pope, out of the Vatican Museums. We'll be on to the Pope. Um, there's three chances you have to um, see the Pope. You can either go to an Angelus um, and the Papal Blessing. It lasts about 20 minutes, and the Pope just basically blesses you and um, blesses any artifacts you brought that you want to be blessed by the Pope. Um, another is the Papal Audience. Um, basically, the Pope will have a message um, prepared, but he, in all of these, he speaks in Italian, so it's kind of difficult to understand. At the papal audience, there is an English interpre interpreter, um, but that one lasts about an hour, um, and so the Pope will speak, and then his message will be translated into English or Polish or whatever other language. <coughs> And then finally, you can see him at a papal mass, um, where he will actually perform a mass in one of the papal basilicas. So this is um, an example of what the Angelus was like. I have a video. Um, I had gotten there an hour before it was supposed to start, and um, already there was tons of people. But in the meantime, while people were waiting, they um, would sing and dance. This was a... Um, a Spanish group that had brought their instruments in through security and, and started playing. And so not all these people are, are Spanish. You can see this guy is Polish, 
but he's dancing, he's joining in. Um, so it's a video. all those different cultures all together all because they want to see Papa Francesco Pope Francis giving and accepting his <laughs> blessing How often does the Pope say mass? Um I, Do you he, know? How he often has, he, he has mass? daily mass he, oh, he yes. celebrates mass daily but uh, that about a few of those during the week are for the general public though lots of times they're in private with small groups of people. Mm -hmm. um, while we were there, uh, Rome celebrated the solemnity, solemnity of St. Peter and Paul, um, which are the two um, patron saints of Rome. So uh, Pope Francis performed a papal mass on um, the solemnity of St. Peter and Paul at St. Peter's um, Basilica. But unfortunately, we weren't able to go because you had to get you're supposed to get tickets, but a ticket is not required to enter. Um, if you have a ticket, you can get up closer. Um, but we weren't able to get tickets, so we ended up going to St. Paul over the wall, um, where the Pope was not there. But they did also have a Mass um, with uh, bishops and cardinals, um, several, probably 50 cardinals um, following the bishop in. So, um, even though we didn't get to see a papal mass, it was still really cool to go somewhere else and um, celebrate St. Paul. Any other questions while we're on that topic? Okay. Um, this is the where the Pope was. He just, at the Angelus. This is his apartment window. He uh, opens his windows, and they drop out this red, red um, banner. <clears throat> and he'll, he says a blessing in Italian. Um, I, I'm not sure what he said, but I know I was blessed and my, my artifacts are blessed as well. Um, also, um, the papal audience, I had the opportunity to go to one as well. Um, I, I thought it started at 10.30. It actually started at 10. Um, so I missed the Pope driving around through the um, aisles, um, greeting people and saying hello, but he did do that. And then this is just a picture of all the people waiting to see Pope Francis and um, hear his message. Um, this is the best picture I could get <laughs> from where I was. Um, but this is him in the center. And these other people around will translate his message from Italian to, to English or to Spanish, or to whatever. There was a, um, a Polish translator as well. So... We had a good representation of Polish people at the papal audience as well. So when the Polish translator is, is speaking, they raise their flags and um, proudly say, that's my language, I, this is, they're speaking to me, you know. And so it was fun to see that group of people um, around as well. But even like at the Vatican, I saw them at the papal audience, at the papal, um, the blessing. Um, and then around Rome, in and around Rome too. So there's a, a large population of Polish people in Rome as well, which was really fun to see, and I didn't know that, that there was that. Um, but with that, I say grazie, and um, thank you all for listening to my presentation. Um, if there's any other questions about my presentation or about anything, Rome in general, um, feel free to ask me. Thank you. My school is called John Cabot University, and um, it was a, an American university, so all the classes were taught in English. Um, my professor and all the students in my class were Italian, but they spoke really good English. But it was just a different dynamic because we got a 
a five minute break in the middle of our class and then as soon as class has ended, um, my classmates immediately started speaking in Italian again and I had no idea what they were saying. So I felt like a little bit of an oddball out, but um, yeah, it's just, it's just crazy that it, they so easily know both English and Italian and, and here in the United States it's just mostly English, so yeah, a little bit different there, yeah. Did you have to deal a lot like language-wise? You know, how did you communicate if they didn't speak English? Mostly English. Um, a lot of people over there already speak English and Italian. Italian first language, English second. Um, but, um, yeah, so for the most part, I, I would greet them in Italian and say please and thank you in Italian and um, do as best as I could. That's really all I, I know is, like, the basics. But, um... A lot of them could just immediately tell that you were American. Um, I don't know if it's the way I dressed, probably it was. Um, but yeah, so immediately they would usually go to speak um, English. Yeah. Yeah. You're saying kids would dress differently than you would? Um, a little bit. They wear a lot of just straight up black and white, not so much color. <laughs> this is funny. My first day of class, <laughs> I was so jet lagged, I went back to my apartment to take a nap before I had to go to class. And um, I missed my alarm and slept in. And I was like 20 minutes late for my first class ever in Italy. And so um, I walked in, I was wearing a white shirt with like red and blue floral flowers on it and, um, and blue jeans and Converse. And I walk in and I'm like, I'm sorry I'm late. <laughs> And my professor's like, oh, it's okay, just sit down. And everyone else is just staring at me like, who is this chick? But I definitely stood out. They were all wearing black and white. Black jeans, white top or whatever. And here I was with my floral shirt. <laughs> but yeah, so um, people definitely dress a little bit different over there. And they all, they usually cover their knees. There's not very many people who just typically wear shorts. Even when it's really hot out. Um, they always still cover their knees. And when you 